What is up, you guys? Welcome back to my channel where we talk about Christianity and biblical sexuality. My name is Taylor Simon Maxwell, and I am the author of The Desire Tree, which is available now on Amazon in paperback form as well as ebook form. The link is down below as well as the novel summary. Also, if you're encouraged by what you hear, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button so you can get notified weekly when I post new content. So today we're going to be talking about homosexual temptations. What does the Bible say about temptations? How did God deal with temptations when he was on earth? And how can we as Christians deal with the temptations that the scriptures say are inevitable to come? So without further ado, we're going to start in Matthew 4. We're going to read the scriptures and then we're going to dive in. So if you want to follow along, I'm going to be reading out of the NLT version. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. Notice that it's the devil who tempts us and not God. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Going back to this idea of temptations and how temptations define us. So for example, with the homosexual struggle, you know, we're living in a world that says, if you have homosexual temptations, you should embrace them. Like literally embrace it with a big bear hug and accept them. But God's word is very clear that when, when it comes to temptations, we are to enter spiritual warfare. That's what this is. Jesus went into spiritual warfare against the devil. And so, you know, you go back to verse 3. It says, the, the devil says, if you are the son of God, tell these stone to become loaves of bread. That's the temptation, right? The devil makes a statement. A temptation is nothing more than a question. It's, it's a knock at the door. It's, hey, you want to go smoke weed? You have not smoked weed until you've smoked weed. Someone asking you if you want to smoke weed does not make you a weed smoker. If someone says, hey, you want to go have sex with me premaritally? You have not committed premarital sex until you've committed premarital sex. And so, likewise with homosexuality, when you get a temptation that's homosexual, what defines the homosexual practice is just that, acting on the temptation. The temptation is not who you are. It's merely just a question being asked. It's the devil calling you on your phone and saying, hey, you should watch gay porn tonight. Hey, you should hook up with that guy tonight. See, it's a question. And so... It's either a question or it's a direction, a sinful, a sinful direction. And what does Jesus do? Jesus enters warfare and says, no, this is key. The scriptures say. And so the three times that Jesus is tempted by the devil in this passage, he starts off for the most part by saying the scriptures say. And then Jesus goes on and cites scripture. The second time, the devil says, he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Notice that the devil recites scripture. The devil knows the Bible better than you and me. I'm just saying. What does Jesus do? He responds back. He's like, boom, you want to fight me with scripture? I'll fight you back with scripture. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, and then he gives scripture. The third time, the devil says, I will give it to you. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Jesus says, get out of here, Satan, for the scriptures say. So this is key. 
This is key. This is why reading the Word of God is so important in the battle of sanctification and the battle to become more and more like Jesus in the battle for your purity. Because when the devil comes and tempts you, we need to learn from how Jesus handled temptation. And we need to fight that temptation with the Holy Word. If the devil comes to you and tempts you homosexually, and you don't know how to fight, you're going to take it. See, the world says just accept homosexual temptations. You know, they're getting like this, and they're just getting clobbered. And they're just like, Satan, yes, just, yes, keep punching me, Satan. But as Christians, God's like, no, hands up, come on, fight back. The second that temptation, if this pencil, I don't know if you can really see this, it's a pencil, the lighting's not that great, you know, that temptation comes into your mind, the second it starts, boom, boom, hit it away. No, no, it's like a, no, no, you know, that's what we have to do. We have to get into this constant battle. This is what spiritual warfare is. Warfare is. This is why the Bible says in Ephesians 6.11 to put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, and the feet fitted with the gospel. We have to be in the word so that when the time comes, when the battle comes, because it's going to come every single day, especially when it comes to sexual temptation, we have to be prepared and we have to know how to fight. We have to know how to punch back. So for example, this is just an example. You know, you're just going about your day and all of a sudden you're getting a homosexual temptation. Boom, it's time to fight. Mind you, real men of God, warriors of Christ, we fight. See, boys, people of the world, this is not what biblical masculinity is. Biblical masculinity is, is part of it is taking up that armor and fighting. People who are boys, boys who are stuck in grown men's bodies, they're passive aggressive and they accept what the enemy calls good, which is actually sin in the eyes of God. They embrace it, but that's not what God calls us to be as men. God calls us to be warriors. God calls us to be fighters. And so going back to this example of fighting the enemy, fighting temptations with scripture, you know, you're living your life and all of a sudden a homosexual thought comes in your mind and you go, nope, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that. Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 2 says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Homosexuality is a sin. I will not act on this temptation. It has no authority over my life and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I lift it up to Jesus Christ. I, I lift up this temptation in the name of Jesus Christ and it is a lie from the enemy. Another example is, and this has happened to me, I'm hanging out with a brother in Christ and I'm having a homosexual temptation and I say in the name of Jesus, no. I rebuke this temptation in the name of Christ Jesus. Satan, you will have no authority or power over me, who I am, and the actions that I choose. This man is a brother in Christ and I love him as a brother in Christ and he is my brother in Christ. And so I rebuke that temptation in the name of Jesus and I lift it up to you now, God. Lord Jesus, come into my mind, come into my heart, have authority, have power, God. And, and fight for me. This idea of homosexual temptations defining you and, and, and telling you who you are is, is absolutely absurd. I mean, think about this. You read in Matthew 4, and, and, and for example, in verse 9, um, or excuse me, I'll go to 8. It, you know, it says, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. So what the devil is doing, he's tempting Jesus. The devil is saying to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I will give you all of this that you are seeing if you kneel down and worship me. And so if Jesus were to kneel down and worship the devil, he would be in rebellion against the Father. Just because the enemy asked Jesus to rebel against God, which is the temptation, it does not actually mean that Jesus is rebelling against God. I'm going to say this again. Satan tempted Jesus and said, rebel against God by worshiping me. And Jesus says, get out of here, Satan, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And so this idea that being asked to do something evil equates to I am that thing, even though I haven't even actually committed it, is absolutely worldly and it's a complete satanic lie. If you find yourself homosexually tempted, your temptations don't define you. They're merely questions. They're knocks at the door. And Christ asks us, and this is what's so beautiful about being in a relationship with Jesus, is that he says, stay on the couch with me. 
you know, you're sitting on the couch with Jesus and temptation's knocking at the door. That homosexual temptation's knocking at the door. And Jesus says, nope, Taylor, sit. Do not get up. Maybe even for a moment you flinch and you're like, oh, I'm going to go get it. Jesus, nope, stay where you're seated. Stay on the couch with me. Do not get up and answer the door. Do not get up and answer the door. If your friend knocked on the door and said, hey, come hang out with me, is him asking you to hang out with him mean that you hung out with him? No. Actually going out and hanging out with him would be you hanging out with him. Likewise, if you walked into a bakery and you saw a slice of chocolate cake on the counter or in the bake case and you found yourself attracted to that chocolate cake and tempted to eat it, that temptation does not mean that you are an eater of chocolate cake. What would make you an eater or a consumer of chocolate cake would be pulling out your wallet, going up to the register, saying, I'll take that slice of chocolate cake in the window, sitting down and consuming it. It's about making a decision. It's about making a choice. It's like, you know what? I'm really tempted to eat that chocolate cake and it looks appealing and it looks really satisfying. And, and the idea, the temptation to eat it sounds amazing, but I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to make a choice not to because I don't want to gain weight or I'm trying to make better decisions about the way I eat. And so that's a lot, that's very similar to the way homosexual temptations work. You know, it's that temptation comes and you make a decision. You're like, you know what? The temptation just came, but I refuse to act on it and I surrender it to the cross. Again, it's this idea of every time you get tempted, it's taking that temptation, it's like a piece of paper and nailing it to the cross. Oh, if I got tempted again, nail it to the cross. Got tempted again, nail it to the cross. Being tempted is not a sin. Being tempted homosexually is not a sin. What is a sin is acting on the temptation. If you were in a relationship and your boyfriend or your girlfriend said to you, let's have premarital sex tonight, are you in sin? No. Are you in sin because they asked you to commit sin? No. What would be sin would be having them tempt you by asking that question and you acting on it. Likewise, if you're home alone tonight and you get tempted to watch pornography, you're in your bedroom by yourself, all of a sudden the temptation comes, Mm, I could watch porn right now. Immediately capture it. You have to immediately snatch that temptation and throw it back to God. Snatch it and throw it back to God. Because the second you let, trust me, I know this so well. This has literally been my life. The second you allow it to creep in and settle, and you give it a, a, just a second to settle in your mind, the tunnel vision starts to go in. And it's hard, it's, it gets harder and harder to say no to the temptation when that tunnel vision begins to creep in. And so what's key is that the second that temptation comes, fight back, like just Jesus did with the scriptures. We need to look at the scriptures and see what Jesus did. I mean, there was no hesitation in Jesus. The devil would be like tempting him and Jesus would be like instantly like, bam, fight back, boom, scriptures. You know, that's what God wants us to do. It's a battle. It's a battle. See, living in the world is easy because you don't have to fight. You just embrace all the temptations that come to you and you don't have to fight against them. You just embrace them. <clears throat> Scripture says that the wages of sin is death. But as Christians, we are called to live a life of life and we're called to be sanctified. And that's what the walk of Christ is like. It's, that's what the, what the walk with Christ is. It's a sanctification process. And so part of being sanctified is fighting temptation. And, and, and getting better and stronger. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And so if you believe the lie that you're the only one struggling with what you've struggled with, Biblically, that is a filthy, dirty lie. One of the enemy's tactics is getting people isolated and getting people to believe that the temptations that they experience are unique to them and them alone. But biblically, we know that that's not true. There's always somebody else out there struggling. I remember once in church, in youth group, I had the pastor said something along the lines of like, was reading from this passage, I believe, and said, I can guarantee you that there's somebody else in this room who is struggling with the exact same thing you're struggling with. And it's so true. 
And it says, God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And so, again, this goes back to that spiritual battle and, and teaming up with God. And, and, and in that moment of temptation, praying out to God, crying out to God, and recalling scripture. I mean, use this passage. Say, God, I'm being tempted right now. And your word says that you are faithful and that you will not allow this temptation to be more than I can stand. So God, come through. Using 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 as a weapon is, is, is incredible because when the enemy comes to tempt you, you can say, no. When the enemy comes and tempts you and says, you have to give in to this temptation. You have to, you have no choice. You have no choice, you are too weak. And you have to, you have no choice. That's a lie. We are not slaves of sin anymore. Cry out to God in that moment. There have been times where I've been tempted and I literally don't have the words to say and I've just said, Jesus, 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 his name over and over and over again and, and called out to him. In moments of temptation, we have to act quick and we have to act as quickly as Jesus did. There was no hesitation for Jesus. The second the enemy tempted him, he was prepped. He was ready to fight back. He had the scripture ready. He had the truth memorized. Notice Jesus isn't like, in this passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, like he just was like, he just spoke truth. He said, the scriptures say, and then he spewed the truth. You know, when the temptations come, if you know who the Bible, or excuse me, if you know who God says you are, you can use that against the devil and he has no power over you. So when the devil says you're a homosexual, you're a faggot, you're feminine, you're worthless, you're nothing, you'll amount to nothing in life. You know what, you should just give in to this temptation. You can fight back with biblical truth and the devil can't stand against it. Oh, Satan, I'm not a homosexual. When the devil says you're a faggot, you're worthless, you're meaningless, you have no purpose, you should give in to this temptation. It's the only way you'll find love. You're so insecure. They'll, they're gonna tell you that you're loved. They're gonna make you feel better about yourself. You can say no. Actually, the Bible says that I'm a new creation, that I'm a child of God, that I'm holy. The Bible says that I'm created for good works in Jesus Christ. Giving into that sexual sin is not a good work. Ephesians 2.10 says you, that you are God's masterpiece. I'm God's masterpiece, and I rebuke that. The Bible says that you're a citizen of heaven, that you're a sheep of his pasture, that you're a child of light, that you're adopted, that you're a saint, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. We're as perfect as the Father is perfect through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are the light of the world, that we have a spirit of power and of love, self-control, that we're heirs. When you begin to get in the word and you begin to realize who you are, it, it does become easier and easier to fight temptation. It's not easy at first, but the more you grow and the more you learn and the stronger you become, the easier it becomes. Think of it like this. If you're really scrawny, it's going to be really hard to lift something really heavy, like a heavy tire, right? Right? But if you get dedicated and you go to the gym every day and you have a really great diet and you're eating lots of food and you're building muscle, in six, seven, eight months to a year, you're going to be physically stronger. And so a year ago, lifting that tire was really difficult. But now you've been prepping. You've been training. And now lifting that tire is really easy because you have the strength to do it. Fighting temptation is not something that you can do on your own. In fact, you can't do it on your own. It's virtually impossible. This idea of I'm going to white knuckle my way through, I'm just going to tell myself don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't, this doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Trust me, I've tried. I've tried. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. No, it doesn't work. You're going to do it, you know? You're going to do it. What works is every single day relying on Christ Jesus and Something that's been helpful for me, um, and this is something that you know people talk about in recovery. Um, that I didn't come up with this. It's essentially the, you know the 24-hour method. You know the Bible says to not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has too many worries of its own. And so for me, what's been very helpful is the 24-hour method. You're living in today's 24-hour period, not tomorrow. The second the thought comes of, oh my gosh, like how am I not going to commit sexual sin, fill in the blank tomorrow? Rebuke that thought. Get rid of that thought. Focus on today. When you wake up in the morning, immediately cry out to God, God, help me. Help me get through today without giving into whatever sexual sin it is that I'm struggling with. Help my mind to be pure. Help my mind to be sanctified, God. Renew my mind. 
help my mind to have thoughts that please you. You know, just because you have a homosexual temptation does not mean that you're not pleasing God. You know, you may be walking across the street today and be homosexually tempted by the man walking across the street. And it's in that instant that you fight back. You fight back. And I also just want to say this, that same-sex attraction is not a sin. Same-sex attraction is not a sin. It's an, a natural attraction, and that is a whole other video that I can do. You know, it's important to understand the difference between a temptation and a same-sex attraction. You know, you might not be able to help yourself from what you're attracted to. Like, you might walk down the street and see a guy with nice biceps and instantly be like, ooh, those are nice biceps. But two things I want to say about that. One, recognizing that same-sex attraction is part of the fall of man and it's unnatural is, is key. Okay? But second, understand that being same-sex attracted is not a sin. It's an, un it's an unnatural attraction because as, as, as men, God designed us to be attracted to women. We weren't designed to be sexually attracted or aroused by other men. But what God wants us to do with our attractions is he wants us to surrender them to him. And I know this is going to sound crazy, and I'm not saying that sin is good. That's not what I'm saying. But I think there's power in a prayer, in the prayer of saying to God, God, I'm thankful that I struggle with what I struggle with. Not because you enjoy your sin or because you're happy with your sin. You know, you're, you, you should be remorseful and, and, and your heart should hurt for the sins that you commit because they hurt God and they're in rebellion against God. But let those temptations be opportunities for you to rely on Jesus Christ and for your relationship with him to grow. You know, when you are tempted homosexually, don't look at those moments as, oh my gosh, oh no, help me, oh my gosh, I'm so miserable. You know, look at those as opportunities to be like, okay, here's a reminder of how badly I need God. But a huge part of healing from homosexuality is asking those deep questions and asking and, and digging and, and trying to understand the deep needs of your homosexual struggle, and asking yourself, why is it that I'm being tempted homosexually? Because every temptation has has deep meaning, right? So like when we read Roman, or Roman, when we read Matthew and we in chapter four and we see Jesus being tempted, specifically, why did the devil tempt him with those things? Right? Like, why didn't the devil tempt him to like steal something? You know, why didn't the devil tempt him to go punch somebody? No, the devil specifically went for things, specifically went for things that would have made sense for who Jesus was. And so the enemy is, is very, very crafty and he's very, very smart. You know, when it comes to temptation, the enemy is not going to tempt you probably in an area that you've never struggled before. That's also key. Like, if you are struggling in an area, it's probably a tactic of the enemy that he's going to continue to go back to that very area you struggle the most. If you've never struggled with stealing, you know, the devil's probably not going to start tempting you to steal. He's going to go back to those areas where he has seen you struggle the most. And so for me in my own life, a huge, um, a huge thing of healing, has, I've received a lot of healing in beginning to understand the tactics of the enemy and understanding, okay, like, why am I being tempted this way? And especially when it comes to homosexual sin, I think asking deep questions and understanding, okay, why am I being tempted? Why am I having these thoughts? And the deep needs that I'm trying to get met. So, for example, I used to really struggle with watching pornography, specifically homosexual themed pornography and of course I watched men and women pornography too but more times than not I would go to homosexual porn and when you watch pornography it's all about diving into a fantasy right you're either pretending that you are that person on the screen or you're or vice or and or you are pretending you're with that person on the screen oftentimes it's both and, and so it's like Diving into a fantasy, it's like, this is why we read books and we read, we watch movies or TV shows because we can kind of escape from our problems and dive into this false reality. And specifically with sexual sin, oftentimes, I'd say all the time actually, all the time, we're going to sexual sin to deal with 
problems that we have. So for me, you know, growing up, I did not have that masculinity that I needed growing up. I didn't have that masculine affection that I should have had as a small boy. And so what I began to notice was that I, what was so appealing to me about the idea of being with a man, put aside the attractions, put aside the lustful thoughts, it was just the idea of connecting with a man. Because that's what sex is, right? It's just you and them. And, and you're connecting in the most vulnerable, powerful way two human beings can connect on planet Earth. And so by watching that pornography and diving into that fantasy for a few minutes, again, putting away all the sexual desires aside, at the root was this man, this man wants me. He wants me. He wants me, Taylor. And he craves me and he's chosen me and I'm his and he's chosen me. And once I realized that the deep desire was just to connect with men, I could start really understanding the temptation and really understanding why I was tempted by men and sexually attracted to men and lustful towards men because all of those things were culminating and created because of this root desire to connect with a man. And once I realized that what I could do in a moment of temptation, so all of a sudden, like, I'll give an example, I'm living my life and I get sexually tempted by a man. I can immediately, immediately cry out to God and fight against the devil and say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this sexual temptation for a man. Because the deep desire is for me to connect with a man. And I do not need to connect with this man in a sexual way. I do not need to sit here and lust after him. And I rebuke this in the name of Jesus. And it is not a sin that I want to connect with a man because I didn't get that connection growing up. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would come into my life right now in this moment, Lord, and you would satisfy that craving to connect with a man. God, I pray that you would give me other male friends because in those male friendships, Lord Jesus, I can connect with men in a healthy way. And so it's beginning to do prayers like that, of understanding the deep reasons. You know, another example could be like um, loneliness. Like a lot of guys watch pornography because they're lonely and they don't even realize it. But let's just say you start to realize that and you're like, wow, this is something that you'll start to notice when you begin to team up with the Holy Spirit is you'll begin to see like a pattern of, wow, I do get tempted every time I have anxiety. Or wow, every time I'm home alone is when I get the most tempted. Or every time I'm in this place at this time, every time I'm lonely, wow, that's so true. I get tempted to watch porn. And so you can start calling out the tactics. You start to know where the bullet's going to hit and where it's going to be, what direction it's going to be shot at from before the devil even pulls the trigger. And so you can say, all of a sudden in that moment, you're home alone and you're being tempted to watch porn and you're like, remember, snatch, fight back, whoa, take a step back. You know, my thing is I, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take a step back, I'll stop, I'll take a deep breath. And then I ask myself, Taylor, wh why am I being tempted right now? What's the deep need? Holy Spirit, help me see what's going on. Okay, I'm having really bad anxiety, and I was being tempted to go to that sin because I thought dealing with my anxiety would be best dealt with by going to that sin. Or, okay, I've been sitting in my house all day alone, and I'm being really tempted, and I'm lonely. Okay, I'm being tempted because the sin is telling me, the temptation is telling me that I could go to that, 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 that filthy thing to deal with my loneliness. And so it's about uncovering. So many people just think that sexual temptation is nothing more than attractions and lustful feelings. And it's so much more than that. That surface level, it's like looking at the ocean and seeing the top of the ocean at the beach and being like, that's all there is to the ocean. Just that level of blue. But that's not true. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of creatures living under there and, and systems and you know, whales and fish and just, there's so much complexity underneath the ocean floor. It's the same thing with our sexuality and our sexual desires. You know, again, going back to this idea of temptations, 
you know, we live in a world that just says, oh, you have sexual temptations for men, embrace it. But God wants us to live a life that pleases him. God wants us to live a life that is in alignment with what he calls moral. And if he calls homosexuality a sin, then it's our duty as Christians to team up with the Father and combat that and fight those temptations. And there is healing at the cross. That's a fact. I've had so much healing in my life thus far from homosexual struggles. And I get so much hate from people on various social media platforms who who are like, God didn't heal you, and you're denying your truth. And the fact of the matter is, is that I have received healing. Because, like I said, that root of the temptation where I was looking for a man to connect with me, once I began to deal with that root, the desire to want to connect with a man in a sexual way began to lose its power. Because I could get tempted to watch gay pornography and... Now that I know, the real reason why I wanted to go to it in the first place was because I was trying to deal with trauma from my childhood. Then all of a sudden, the desire to go to that pornography, it kind of loses its power because it's like, I mean, I like really am being tempted to watch it, but I know deep down the real reason why I want to go and watch the porn is because I'm trying to deal with this broken thing from my childhood and this broken thing from my childhood. And you're like, ugh, I don't want to be that person. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be that person who deals with their childhood trauma by traumatizing themselves more with perversion. Like, I want to be the person that goes to God instead. And it's not easy. It's not like you just, okay, you know, it's, it's daily, daily, daily getting up and surrendering to God. And let me also just say too, like, a lot of people think that if you go let's just say you go 30 days without watching porn and then you slip, it's like, oh my gosh, I threw away my 30 days. That's not true. You went 30 times for 30 24 hour periods resisting and you slipped. And I would say in the name of Jesus, get back up warrior and keep fighting, keep fighting the good fight. And remember that Jesus has not forsaken you. He loves you. He's fighting with you and for you. Do not believe the enemy's lies. Oh, you went 30 days, but you slipped. Those 30 days have been completely thrown away. No. Those 30 days have not been thrown away. That would be like, oh my gosh, I use so many gym metaphors because I'm like low-key gym rat. But imagine if for 30 days you ate healthy and worked out. For 30 days straight and ate super healthy. And then one day you became really lazy. You slept in. You ate like three hamburgers and a milkshake and you didn't go to the gym. Would that one day of bad decisions ruin and destroy all those 30 days of good eating and healthy working out? No. You know, those 30 days counted for something. And they're only proof that God is working in your life. So give yourself grace when you do slip. Also, you know, repent, obviously repent, turn from your ways, ask God to forgive you, but get back up on your horse. You know, if you were in a battle and, and, and this goes back to spiritual warfare and Jesus fighting spiritual, spiritual battles, you know, against the enemy with scripture. You know, if you were in a battle, like straight up like Lord of the Rings style battle, and you were on your horse fighting, and you got knocked off your horse, would you like squeal on the ground screaming and like, <laughs> no, you would get back up on your feet as fast as you possibly could. You would get back up on your horse and you would charge back into battle. You know, that's what we need to do in our battle for our purity. That's what we need to do in our battle for our masculinity. That's what we need to do in our battle for our identity in Christ is that every time the enemy tries to lie to us about who we are as men, every time the enemy tries to lie to us and tell us that we are our homosexual desires and our thoughts, our temptations, we have to get back on our horse and say, no, Satan, no, Satan. Just like Jesus said, no, Satan, get out of here. Like, bro, get out, get out. You have no say in who I am. I am washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am not a homosexual. My temptations do not define me. I am defined by who Jesus Christ says I am. Jesus Christ bought you on the cross. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were washed clean by the blood and you are now God's. 
And if you belong to God, only God gets to tell you who you are. That would honestly be like if Susie's parents on the playground were telling you who you should be and how you should act and how you should behave and how I should live my life. But only my parents get to decide how I act and how I should live. And only they get to discipline me. Likewise, the devil has no say in who you are. The devil has no say in how you should live your life. Living in this place of thinking that you have a thought and that means that who, that's who you are is such a dangerous place to be. And the thing is, is that, you know, scripture tells us the enemy is all about confusion and God is all about truth. And so if all of a sudden you're just living your life and you have a homosexual thought, you know, and now you're starting to think, oh my gosh, I had a homosexual thought. That must be who I am. Maybe I'm gay. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? See, these, that's all about confusion, right? Like, it's all about confusion and who am I and what am I? The, God's not about confusion. God is about this is who you are, plainly, simply, and clearly. There's never a question with God when it comes to who you are in Christ. For a minute, let's not even talk about homosexuality. Let's just talk about heterosexuality. Because sexual temptation and sexual sin is not exclusive to just men and women who struggle with homosexuality. Sexual temptation is for every single human being. Every single human struggles with sexual brokenness and sexual temptation and sexual sin in some way, shape, or form in their lifetime. And so, for example, let's just say there's a guy and he's on a date with his wife at a really fancy, nice steak restaurant. And he planned the whole thing, and he's taking her out on Friday night, and they're having a romantic evening together, husband and wife. And the waitress comes up to the table, and instantly, he is tempted by her. He's like, I am attracted to her, and I find her beautiful. And now he's faced with a decision. He's faced with a decision. Am I going to sit here and lust after this waitress while I'm sitting here with my wife, or... Am I going to stop the attraction where it's at and look away and say, in the name of Jesus, I have eyes for my wife and my wife alone. And so likewise, men who struggle with sexual temptation, who don't struggle with homosexual but heterosexual temptation, still have to put this into practice. Now, of course, a man being attracted to a woman sexually is a natural attraction. That's the way God designed it. Homosexual attraction is unnatural, but there's a similarity in that there's always a choice to be made. I get so many messages from, from men specifically who have this idea or this belief that, you know, my temptations are just what they are and I'm just going to accept them and I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to struggle with this for the rest of my life. And that's just not true. Like you can get free of pornography. You can get free. You can fight back. You don't have to be a Christian and just let the enemy punch you. You can actually walk in sanctification and you can walk in healing and you can be set free. In conclusion, I just want to say this. Temptations don't define you. Only Jesus Christ gets to say who you are. And in a world that says your thoughts are who you are, if you think it, you are it. Cleave to the Lord. Cling to the Lord. Cling to the Lord every single day. Every single day, we have to die to ourselves. We have to live for Jesus and not live for the world. Our temptations don't define us. Only Jesus gets to define who we are. When the Lord began to reveal that to me, it set me free from a mindset. Because every single time I had a same-sex attraction or every time I had a lustful desire, Instantly, it was followed by, oh my gosh, that means I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay. And it's like, no, that's not my identity. No, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I'm a masculine, mighty man of God, created by God in my mother's womb. He has a plan and a purpose for my life, and it's not in this sin. Begin to start fighting. As men, we have to rise up in our biblical masculinity and start fighting against temptation. Because if you don't fight, if you don't fight, you're going to let the enemy tell you how you should think, how you should behave, and you're going to believe lies about yourself. It is up to us as men to rise up and fight. Fight like your life depends on it. Put on that spiritual armor. Ephesians 6.11, put it on and fight. 
go to war. Stay obedient to Christ. It's hard, especially with homosexuality, because unlike so many other sins, homosexuality is unique in that the world embraces it and says that it's good, and the world says that you should live that way and that you shouldn't fight it. But that's exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy wants you to tuck your arms in if you struggle with homosexuality and just take the punches and not fight it and embrace it. But God says, no, you are, a, you are a man of God and I have designed you to be masculine and mighty. So let me dress you in my armor, my son, and let's go to war. I love you guys. I'm praying for you and I will see you next time.